Good morning. Good morning. I'm surprised. We said about 20 minutes ago, it was raining real hard, and I said, I bet everybody's just about to walk out the door and said, yeah, we'll just watch on Zoom. But you all came. Nice to have you all here this morning. We are uh, here on the first Sunday of October, which uh, traditionally in much of the Christian church world is World Communion Sunday. So as you see, we have everything ready for our communion service. And uh, those of you on Zoom, if you were not aware of that, if you want to make sure you have some bread and a drink uh, to be prepared for communion a little bit later, uh, that would be great. Just given, Kevin, you getting a thumbs up from anybody that you're on? They hear you? They hear me? Thumbs up somewhere? We got it. Okay. So, welcome. Want to cover any announcements this morning that you might have? Anything over here that needs to be shared? Oh, go ahead, Betty. Trinell, do you have... We will miss you, Betty. We will miss you, Betty. And you guys have safe travels, but we know you will be with us on Zoom. We know you'll be with us in your heart and all of that. So, so we, we have to have a really good service today to, to lead Betty out of here. So, yeah. So thanks for sharing that, Betty. Dave? Discover Denver this Saturday. So they've done that a few years now where Main Street will be closed off and there'll be things all morning on Main Street in Denver. And then I believe at noontime they move everything down to the park. But they've been advertising this for quite some time. We're, we're in the advertisement. We're kind of the south side of town activity. So people will know that we're down here. So we are kind of, it's kind of hard to say if we're going to get more than usual or less than usual because of everything that's going on. But we are heavily advertised for this thing for the last several months. So the more help we can have available, that would be, that would be wonderful if you can help out in some way. Other folks? With announcements, go ahead, Bob. Good morning, let you know. I have to take a leave of absence from Homes and Boat Committee. So if anyone is interested in joining that committee, we need one the fourth Tuesday of the month, 7 o'clock p.m. at Spawn Blue. Anybody interested? Thanks. And that's a, a great ministry we have been a part of, and we're part of, I believe, kind of starting. So uh, we'd like to have some representation there and thank Bob for serving as he has. So if there is anyone that would like to step in on that, as Bob said, please, please speak with him. So a couple other items of, of note here, um, just going through things that haven't been said already. So it is a new month. We'll have a new mission emphasis this month. It is real life community services here in Denver. Throughout the month, we are going to start collecting for Harvest Home. We will dedicate the Harvest Home items um, the last Sunday of this month, which is October 30th. So each Sunday throughout, we invite you to bring a non-perishable food items, paper products, those sort of things. I believe we, uh, on the green sheet of announcements, if you want to take that with you, we actually have a list of the things Real Life is kind of looking for this month. Uh, but you can bring anything. Uh, this goes toward their food pantry that's that's servicing the Cacalico uh, area here. So um, please give generously throughout the month for that. Consider Real Life as well. Uh, on October the 16th, Rod Redkay, the director of Real Life, will be here to share about Real Life and also share uh, the morning message that day. So um, keep Real Life in your thoughts and, and in your, act, your shopping activity throughout the month. Uh, next Sunday is going to be, uh, everything's different. 
So we have our worship at 3 o'clock next Sunday, not at 10.15. Remember that. If you come here at 10.15, the doors will be locked, and you'll be standing out in the rain. Speaking of that, oh, when it rains like today, we are opening the door down by the offices. Okay? We try to keep that locked so that we're trying to still keep things from having lots of people wandering through and COVID, la, la, la. But when it rains, we want you to be able to get in as quickly as you can. So that door will be unlocked on rainy Sunday mornings. So keep that in mind for the future. It was unlocked today, but you didn't know that, so you all were walking up here anyway. So locked. However, that being said, rain or shine, next Sunday morning at 10.15, it's all locked, because we're not coming. But we are going to have our worship at 3 o'clock. It will involve the installation, or as Philip called it, coronation of me into the position of pastor, which is long overdue, needs to be done, and we'll do that in the context of the worship service at 3 o'clock. At 1 o'clock, prior to the worship service, we're inviting you all to come and be a part of our rib barbecue fellowship, picnic fellowship, whatever. Um, we just like you to sign up. There's a sign-up sheet out there. We already have about 40 people signed up for it. Uh, we want you to sign up so that we know how much ribs, how many ribs to make. Also, uh, we're going to have ice cream and brownies for the dessert. We're just asking if you're able. If you're not, don't worry about it. You can still come. But if you're able to provide a side dish of some sort, hot or cold, uh, that would be wonderful. But that's going to start promptly at 1 o'clock. And we'll eat together for an hour or so. Um, and then since we got 40 people here, we're going to clean up really quickly together. That would be great. And get ready for the service at 3. OK? So that is next Sunday. Got it. And last thing, just let me update you on some pastoral concerns. Uh, again, we continue to keep Scott Swigert in prayer. Scott is in Lancaster General. He's still there. He's in the ICU. And in fact, he was on, uh, he was on a breathing apparatus, which they have now removed. He is still relatively unconscious. To be honest, the, uh, the idea here probably was in removing that breathing apparatus, uh, Scott may not continue, may, may not survive. So they are aware that that's a possibility and the family has agreed to, to let that happen if that happens. Um, they are waiting to see how he responds to this. Currently, as of it being done yesterday afternoon, he is unconscious, but still stable. So please keep Scott's family in your prayers, his daughter Jada, his sister's Hope and Faith and Vicky and Bonnie and, and everyone else, many of whom you, you know. And finally, I want to lift up uh, Dave and Marcy Dunmoyer. Dave has been having some significant issues with his back that's requiring potential surgery with both his eyes, cataracts that will require some surgery and uh, just going through the misery of all that. So Dave doesn't usually let us all know that, but he let me share that with you and does appreciate prayers. He wants prayers for Marcy more than him, because I guess he must think he's being a pain to Marcy. I don't know. But prayers for both of them, I'm sure, at this time, if you would. So we have gathered together to worship. And today, we worship being mindful not only of St. John's United Church of Christ in Denver, Pennsylvania, but also the fact that we are part of a Christian community that expands all over the world. A third of the world, a third of the world, at least, identifies itself as Christian. And today, yesterday, depending on what time zone you're in, many, many of those churches have been doing the one thing that we all agree on, which is this service of communion to remember that it all is based on what Jesus Christ did for us with a broken body and a spilled blood. So we join not only ourselves, but many down the road, across the borders, across the oceans, in worshiping our God this morning. The God who is a great God above all else and the God who we speak of with our wonder and our songs and our prayers. So I invite you to rise for our first hymn today. Glorious things of these are spoken. It's hymn number 598. You can look on the screen. You can go with your hymnals. But let's sing out unto the Lord.
Let us pray. We are your children, O oh Lord God, and to you we come today bowing our hearts before you, lifting our prayers up to you, standing, sitting, singing, praying, being here in awe and wonder of your splendor and your majesty. May we be fed by you and your word and the communion time we have. Likewise, may we be fueled to go forth and serve you as we gather around your word today. Lord, bless us as we've come. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we're seated, again, we join not only the world, let's come from the bigger picture, from the world to across the sea, to across the borders, to across the pews. We are God's children. We are God's people together. So remind each other of what we have in Christ Jesus, that peace that is ours as you pass the peace of Christ to one another before we're seated. The peace of Christ be with you all. Peace of Christ be with you all. Peace of Christ be with you all. Yeah, I see you right You know which question children usually like to ask the most? Out of those five? Why? Yes, exactly. Why? Why? Take out the trash. Why? Go to bed. Why? Right? It's always a question. Why? And we're always asking that question. Although, you know what? I've read somewhere where children ask why questions like, I don't know, 60 times a day, adults. The older you get, the less you ask why. But you think we adults think we know that. And we really don't. But we stop asking why. We ask why questions because we're, we want to know. We want to know when, how things started, why things started, where they came from, why should we do what we're supposed to do, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to keep encouraging you to ask why questions. But we do have an answer to everything. There is always an answer in the church here. When we ask why we do this, why we do that. Why do we have to go out and decide to play? Yes, that's, I guess that's a question you have during the week. You got to take that up with the state. I think it's something we can see. But anyway, so, let me just leave that. I want you to remember that in our lives, God wants us to be faithful to Him. Why? Why should I love somebody who maybe isn't very nice to me? Why should I go to church? Why should I learn about the Bible? Why should I sing a song to God? Why should I be nice? Why should I, why should I, why should I? There is an answer. The answer is not this. The answer is why should I do anything? It's because God loves me. And the Bible tells us there's all sorts of things we can say about God. Who is God? Why did God do this? How did God do that? What does God do here? When did God do all that? In the end, the Bible says one specific thing about God. God is love. So why to anything? Especially in people with our faith and trying to be like Jesus. Why do we love? Because God loves us, okay? And that never changes. 
We may not know the answer to everything, but one answer we know is that God loves us. That's the answer of everything that we do here in the church. Everything we do is believers in Jesus, okay? All we do remember is that's what's behind Jesus tells us to do. You are a great God who is above everything else, oh God, and you care about your people. You care about us. You care so much that you send Jesus for us. That's what your love looks like. And whatever we find out we're supposed to be doing, whatever goodness, kindness, gentleness, loving thing that we're called to do, we do it because you already loved us. So may Lila and Finn and Rowan and all of us know today that that's the basis of everything for us. Your love. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you are going to go on with this uh, to continue to learn a little bit more about Moses and leading his people and this great God who cares about us. Okay? Thanks for joining. So I am going to invite Howard to come on up and share our passage today. It is the passage that we've been reading throughout the week from 1 Corinthians with Paul talking to us about our communion time. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. <clears throat> this passage is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you proceeds to eat your own supper. And one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have households to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink. Drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be unanswerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves. And only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. About the other things, I will give you instructions when I come. So I like that question, why? I ask it a lot of myself. I ask it a lot of things around me. I, I'm always intrigued by the origin of things, particularly stuff that's just been around for a long time that we easily forget those origins. Now, when it comes to origins, you can also 
you got to do your research because you might discover that it, it may all be baloney. For instance, I learned a long time ago that in, in England, you know, back in the Middle Ages, there was a period of time where being a, a, an old and an ancient and a small country, there had become a point probably around the time of the plague where there was so much death and people dying that they ran out of space to place the bodies. So they actually had begun to unearth the old coffins and take the bones to what were called bone house and then place new remains and bury them. What supposedly they found was one out of every 25 caskets had scratch marks on the inside of the lid, indicating that the people had been buried alive. Now, at the same time in England and other places, but particularly in England, there was the common issue of people drinking heavy alcohol, hard liquor, and they would do so from lead-based mugs. And the combination of the hard liquor and the lead would knock these people out for a while. They'd be laying on the street, nobody knew if they were dead, so they'd take them home, lay them out, and wait for a day or two to see if they woke up. Supposedly, that's where you get the idea of a wake. But some of them didn't do so well. They ended up in the coffin, and then they were alive. So what they decided to do was they would tie a string around the wrist of the dead person, run it through the casket up to the ground to a bell. And someone would wait overnight to see if that bell rang to indicate that somebody was actually alive down there. So this is where we get the idea of the graveyard shift. It's where we get the idea if someone rings the bell, they are saved by the bell. And if they ring the bell, they are a dead ringer. I learned about that a few years ago. I have since researched it and discovered none of that is true in terms of where those phrases came from. There is supposedly truth to people being buried alive unintentionally, and that they might have actually had a, a bell that they rigged up for that purpose. But it's not where we get dead ringer from, it's not where we get graveyard shift from, it's not where we get any of those things from. Today, we're even probably in worse shape because people pass information on to each other and act as though it's all fact, and we know about that, we know about this this problem where we're, we're all getting so much information, but we're not really checking it out. And sometimes we, don't, we just don't know the, the background of something, and we find ourselves doing something without knowing the background, and before we know it, we're caught up into something that we never intended to be. We can get in trouble when we don't know why something is as it is. One more fun little story I came across was a a, a dying Irishman. It's not fun, but it's part of the story. He is on his last days, and in his last breath, he takes in the aroma of his favorite thing ever, chocolate chip cookies. And so, with all of his last ounces of energy, he gets himself out of his bed, and he makes his way down to the kitchen, and lo and behold, his kitchen tables are full of uh, hundreds of chocolate chip cookies. So he's not sure if he actually died and went to heaven, or his wife of 65 years was choosing to do something in his last breath that she knew he would love. So this weak, dying man makes his way to the closest table, and just as he's about to pick up one of those cookies, his hand is swatted with a spatula, and there stands his wife and says, don't you touch those, they're for the funeral. So if we don't know why something is as it is, we can get ourselves in trouble. So today, I want to ask the question, why do we do this? Why do we commune? 
Why do we do this, this ritual? Now, fortunately for us, we don't have to go back to some uncertain hand-me-down stories that when you really investigate, you find they may not be true. We go back to Scripture, which, granted, some people would say is exactly defined as I described, as I just described it, but for us, no. Because in here, there is specifically something that happened that led to that. There is Jesus who meets with his disciples shortly before he's going to die. And he breaks the bread at the meal that they're having. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do it in remembrance of me. And then he takes the cup and he sips from it. And then he said, in this cup is the new covenant of love that flows through my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. And so the disciples had no idea what he was talking about until he died. And then they began to remember Jesus in that way. And we get a glimpse of this only maybe what's probably only about 20 or 30 years later, not very long, with the church in Corinth as Paul has to reprimand them relative to this ritual. Now, it's a little different in the church of Corinth. See, you might remember the first churches, it says these people began to get together, they'd worship together, they'd, they'd break bread together. And they would take all that they have and put it in a pot, and they'd take care of each other's needs. They were a community. And in Corinth, there was a community that Paul wrote to because he heard in this Christian community, they were getting together, but they weren't taking care of each other. See, they would get together for a meal, not a little shot glass of juice and a little cube of bread. They actually had a meal. Because in their midst, there was not rich and poor, male or female, slave or free. There was Christian. And they made sure everybody had what they needed. So they would come together for a meal. But what was happening in the Corinth church was apparently they would come together for this meal. But some people, primarily the ones who had, would eat to their fill. They'd get drunk. And then the people who didn't have still didn't have. And Paul reprimands them. He says, what do you think? I should commend you for this? No, I'm not going to commend you for this. Don't you have homes to eat in? If you're hungry, eat in your home. But when you come here, it's not about you getting hungry. It's not about you having your fill. It's about making sure everybody has their fill. And he says, so look at yourself. And here is a great misreading, I think, over the years of this passage. Many churches, including our Reformed Church, of which we're a background in our liturgy, the look at yourself is look at yourself. Make sure you're worthy to commune. So we used to have a preparatory service. You remember the preparatory service? Some of you do. A week before you had communion, you prepared yourself, got yourself right with God. It all was based on this passage, except that's a misreading of the passage. The passage is saying, be aware of yourselves, meaning be aware of your group. Be aware of the body, it says. Make sure the body is being taken care of, because for this reason, because of your own self-indulgence, some are sick and some have died, literally, because they're not getting fed, because some of you are coming here and eating to your heart's content and drinking to your drunk, and everything's running out. And in the midst of this meal, you're, you're doing this communion thing, so why are they doing the communion thing? Why do we do the communion thing? And why is he reprimanding them? The reason we do this is because Jesus said, take this bread, it is my body, eat it in remembrance of me. Drink this drink in remembrance of me. We are remembering. When we do this in a few minutes, we are remembering three things. One, above all else, we're remembering the death of Jesus, the sacrificial death of Jesus. This is my body for you. This is my blood for you. I am giving my life 
for you. And when we come before these elements, we are remembering that that's the basis of it all. Sacrificial love. Christ did it for you personally and me personally. Christ did it for you in that corner, you in that corner. You at that table at the meal, you at that table at the meal. Christ did it for all of you. You who declare the name of Jesus, whether you're in Denver or you're in Ethiopia. You. Sacrificial love. Gave himself for us. So we remember Jesus' death. And then we're doing this to remember each other. This is not a solitary thing that you do here today. Yes, you sit in that pew with your bread and your, and your cup, and you should be thinking about your faith and your relationship with God, absolutely. But you should also be thinking about the fact that we're doing this together. Some of you back in the day, when you got married, might have had communion at your, at your wedding. We don't do that as much anymore. And I believe in the Catholic Church, they still do. But back in the day, if you had communion at your wedding, most of the time, most of the time, what it was, was the pastor would commune the couple. Some of you might have had that experience. That's not an appropriate way of communing. To give the bread and the cup to two people while there's 150 sitting out there watching? Communion is a reminder that we're all in this together. It reminds us that there's someone beyond just me. Jesus died for the world, for God so gave his son for the world. God so loved the world. So when we put that bread, that body, when we drink that juice, that blood, we are remembering Jesus died for me and everybody else. This isn't just me. It's all of us. So we remember each other. Unfortunately, our churches do remember each other, but most of the time, like this church in Corinth, there's all these divisions. Paul speaks of that in a paragraph before that which Howard read. He talks about how there's all these divisions in the church. So what was happening, it was like, uh, I don't know, a family reunion where they were coming together, but over in that corner sat Joe's family, and over in that corner sat Sarah's family, and over in that corner sat Frank's family. Although they were all Smiths, they still just sat and ate with the people they knew best. There is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no slave, there is no free. We're all Christians. There are no divisions in the church. We're all together with each other. Communion reminds us of that. And the third thing we're remembering is we're remembering our posture. How it is we, we are because of Christ. Because what we are remembering is the sacrificial love of Jesus for everyone, and we are now also remembering that that's who we're to be too. That's what we're to do. That is our posture in life. There's a difference between being in a position and your posture. Your posture you kind of have. A position is something you try to create. Today in Christianity and the churches were full of people with positions holding a position on this, holding a position on that. What do you think about this? What's your stand on that? But we're supposed to be about our posture, which is people who give of ourselves for others, as Jesus gave from the cross. We get so wrapped up in defending Jesus with positions, forgetting that Jesus needs no defense from us, he needs us to be his representatives. 
The church today is accused by people outside of the church and inside of the church of four primary things. No matter what you, what study or subject, or excuse me, what study or survey you follow, these four things always come up when questioned about the Christian church today. Number one, the church is for judgmental people. Number two, hypocritical people. Number three, anti-people. We know what they're against. We don't know what they're for. And number four, they're people who are pushy with their beliefs. We are people with a bunch of positions, and we're going to judge you over them. We're going to be hypocritical because though we hold these positions, we're very contradictory in the way we live. We're pushy with those positions. And most of those positions don't tell you what we believe. They tell you what we don't believe. All that because somehow we're afraid we're losing the church and we're losing Jesus to our world and all that. God doesn't need us to defend him. God needs us to represent him. That's our posture. Our posture is to be people who are here for one another. As Christ gave of himself up for us, we are giving of ourselves for one another. In the Corinth church, they were reprimanded because they would come into that gathering and they all got what they wanted. They got enough food for themselves and then some. They got enough drink for themselves and then some at the expense of others. Nobody wanted to wait. Paul said, wait for each other. Instead, they all just indulged. Paul said, if you want to do that, do it at home. That's not what we're about. We're about waiting on each other, being patient, giving up on myself so that you can have, because we're all in this together. The thing I have found saddest of all the things that I've experienced as a pastor over these years is getting people in my church, church I serve, any place I've been, People who I've watched get to know each other, love each other, care for each other. And then as time goes on, having people leave because they don't like our worship or they don't want just an organ, they want a guitar or they want a pastor who's a little more flashy, doesn't wear a suit and tie or, or, they, or they want something for their children, and they leave. And what hurts me about that isn't, I get it, I, we're consumers and that's sad, but what's even more sad is when I run into those people and countless times I would hear the very same thing, which was this, oh, I miss the people back at church. Oh, I miss them so much. But I really like this church, their music's a lot more lively. Or well, I like this church because they, they have some things for the children. What they're missing is the fact that the church is the people. Jesus did not say, here's my body broken for you. Remember how I taught you to worship. Here is my blood shed for you. Remember my stand on this issue. Here's my body broken for you. Remember how I showed you I have a carnival atmosphere for your children. Here's my blood shed for you. Remember how I taught you to sing with a guitar and drums. No, he said, this is my body broken for you. Remember me. Me, who's about to die on a cross to show you how much God loves you. That's who we are. That's our posture. Why do we do this today? To remember what Jesus did for us. That sacrificial love to remember each other because he did it for all of us, and to remember we're called to the same as we go. That's why we do this. And it's to that that I invite us today to remember, to remember Christ and the world of Christians around us, not just ourselves, and the posture we have to the other rest of the world that is longing to see someone show them this love that we talk about. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you as we've gathered together today to worship you and to do so mindful that we don't do this by ourselves 
at 659 South 4th Street in Denver. But we do this aware that we are part of something greater. The very body of Christ to which we are connected. We come here joining voices that have already been singing, that are going to sing after us unto you. A world of voices. We are coming to join the saints in light and the saints here and now in proclaiming you. And we come remembering as we approach this altar, as we receive these elements, as we go back to the pews and ponder, and as together we partake. We remember the love you share for us in Christ, for us, for the person sitting next to me, beside me, behind me, in front of me, across the street, down the road, again, across the lines and the seas. Let our hearts be reminded. Let our joy be overflowing as we remember Nothing is only about myself. I need not carry the burdens of the world on my own shoulders, but I have a God who is with me, and I have the body of Christ all around me. We come to you, Lord, to this meal. Let us feel your presence as we pray, as we listen to our anthem, and as we prepare to partake. Hear us as we pray to you, O Lord, and receive us now as we pray to you that prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will be blessed with the choir's anthem, and as they're singing, again, let our hearts be prepared to meet God in communion.
So as Paul reminded those from Corinth who gathered, I remind us as the church here. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread at the meal with his disciples. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At that same meal, he lifted up the cup. And after drinking from it, he said, in this cup is the new covenant of love that flows through my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. And now for us, O oh Lord, as we come before these elements of bread and drink, may we know we are coming before the broken body and spilled blood of Christ. And that as we gather together and wait upon each other and then together commune, may we be filled with the fullness of life that comes from the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. Open our hearts and our minds to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All is ready. You might remember how we have been communing for some time now. You will be ushered out pew by pew and can come forward in two lines. Matt and myself will be here to give you the bread. You step to the left or to the right and take a cup from the tray. Go back to your seat and wait until we're all served and together you will commune. The meal is ready. Come, God is here.
So for us today, in our hands is that broken body of Christ, that spilled blood of Christ. Remember him, remember each other, and remember the posture you take as you go forth from here, giving of yourself as Christ gave for you. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for your sins. Take and drink. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep and preserve you, body, soul, and spirit unto life everlasting. Amen. Would you please rise? Let us give thanks. God, we have been here, and so have you. We thank you for always fulfilling that promise that you will never leave nor forsake us. We are grateful that you have fed us today with your word, with the elements of communion and with the reminder of who we are and what we have and why we do it. Bless and keep us as we go forth for you always. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're closing our time with our final hymn in Christ. There is no East or West. It's hymn number 603 in your hymnals or it will be on the screen while along. Thank you.
East, west, north, and south, may we go. Go knowing that we go in the name of Christ, in the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Go. Amen. You may be seated.